I'd like to call the General Committee meeting to order. Would I please rise for prayer and the pledge? Dear Heavenly Father, we call upon you this evening asking for your guidance in our decision making. Give us the wisdom to make our judgments based on the best interests of this community and the children we serve. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Mr. Campbell, would you lead us in a pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Foche, uh, roll call. Mr. Campbell? Here. Mr. Egan? Here. Ms. Jackson? Here. Ms. Lee Bowman? Ms. Lemoyne is not with us. Ms. Dysart? Here. Mr. England? Here. Mr. Long? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Mr. Warner? Here. And Ms. White? Here. Thank you, Ms. Foche. I'd like to take a part of privilege, please. Uh, we had a, a birthday this, this month. And I think Ms. Collie Jackson, happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Hope you have many more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good, thank you. All right, move on to item number two, Education Committee. Ms. White. Hi, thank you. Yes, um, I'm Ms. Uh, Madam. Madam. Hi, good evening. I just wanted to give you an overview of the upcoming spring testing dates that we have for our elementary through high school students. And just before I briefly go through the dates, I just want to take a minute to thank the teachers and administrators and students and parents for all their tireless work throughout the school year to master the standards in the midst of these unprecedented times through a pandemic. And although these test scores will give a letter grade at the end, it won't really quantify all the tireless efforts the teachers and administrators and parents have done to help the students emotionally keep them up, pick them up, and help them move forward throughout the year. So it definitely has been some unprecedented times, and I did want to take a minute to acknowledge that. So if you take a look at the calendar that I gave you, I try to give you some color codes to help you understand the different tests that we'll be having in the spring. So the gray is third grade paper base. So third grade is the only grade we have left taking the spring testing in paper. Fourth grade on up, all a computer. So thankfully, we've been able to provide those Chromebooks to the classrooms, the students in the classrooms, mm -hmm. all the way through. And that makes a big difference practicing during the year and working during the year since they'll be judged if they can master the standards by what they can do on the computer from fourth grade on up. So third grade is our only grade on paper. And that, of course, runs um, April 27th on down through May 3rd. English and math come in the first three days, and then science and social studies. Then the green is the elementary fourth and fifth grade LEAP 2025 computer base. So fourth and fifth are on computer. And you'll see in the green, the fourth and fifth run May 9th through May 16th. In the green, English, English and math the first three days and science and social studies the next three days. Then we have in, in yellow the middle school, grades six through eight, computer based. That'll run April 26th. English math first three days all the way through May 3rd, rounding out with three days of science and social studies computer based. Along the way, we have the blue high school leap 2025. Those are algebra and geometry, English one, English two, biology and US history. Students taking those courses will take these tests along the way. And then in the pink, we have the AP exams for high school as well. And you'll see we test through May 16th with some makeup days along the way. And the last day for students is May 23rd. So um, we will be testing right close through the end. And if you look after the calendar, I did want to provide with, um, I did want to give a quick shout out to Mrs. Lexi Pritchard. She created these uh, flyers for the elementary and middle school parents and the schools post them at the door. So when the parents come in, they've been up for a couple of weeks, they can know about planning doctor's visits and different things around these certain dates. You know, sometimes it takes a month to get a doctor's appointment nowadays, so we've had these flyers posted at the school. Thank you. Thank you. And why don't you just mention the uh, ELL testing mm -hmm. and the Louisiana, uh, 
completely. Who's going to connect LEAP, testing yes. and how long we've been doing those. Yes, and actually we started high school LEAP 2025 testing back, you know, in December for the fall test. We did that through December through January. Then in February, we tested ELPT tests for our English language learner students. And those, those go about a month-long window because part of those tests are individually. It's speaking and listening, so some of those tests are done one-on-one. -on -one. Additionally, in that February um, w window, we also did LEAP Connect. Those are for our significantly disabled students. They take those tests. So we've been testing at the high school level since December all the way through. And we had ACT along the way in March as well. So since December, high school's been testing. And elementary and middle started with LEAP Connect and ELPT in February. Hmm. All we do is test. All we do is test. Uh, yes. Um, so this doesn't... Uh include the, uh, oh yes leap the leap tests are included here um, are we still getting the results uh, of leap tests at a late date we've been getting them the end of July the last two years end of July so. okay so that's plenty of time to get get the uh, the uh, results back to the parents and and they'll know if their child is being being promoted Yes, and we, um, we do summer programs throughout the summer for anyone who, who, need, who needs to pass based on grade level work if they've not passed their test in the, in the school year. Uh, we don't find out the test scores until end of July, but those aren't going to hold anybody back. Okay. Okay, at one time they were being held back, mm -hmm. but not anymore. Right, right. Okay. We do and put we those students on individual academic plan and give them extra assistance throughout the year. It used to be where mm -hmm. we would get the results um, by the end of the school year, mm -hmm. at which point we could make promotional decisions, but not only just promotional decisions, but summertime decisions mm -hmm. for many kids based upon those assessments. But now, uh, with the assessments, so many of them, and now they are much more, they're not multiple choice, there are some multiple choice questions, but a lot of it is constructed response and essay writing. So all of those have to be scored, and it takes a longer period of time. Um, <laughs> we used to, if you remember, we called it Data Fest that we used to do in June and July based on the results so that we could plan the next year with an overall view of how the kids did. But now that we're getting results so late at the end of July, sometimes even beyond that, mm -hmm. it makes that planning for the next school year much more difficult as a school-wide focus. Because um, if you could see maybe this year's fourth grade perhaps had not scored as well in certain areas in the third grade, then you could put more emphasis and fill a gap where we're finding these results out right at the end of the summertime right when we're getting ready to start and then you've got to analyze it even more to see what the actual subdomains look like and then which kids and which grade levels are having issues so it's it's just one of those things we're in a continual testing and assessment environment and it does not in my opinion help um, from a planning point of view for school systems to plan in the best interest of the kids because of the lateness of the results. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. Thank you, Ms. Lametta. Um, I know in the past, Ms. Focho, Ms. Lametta, we, we have asked the state if we can get the testing results back earlier so we can help mm -hmm. those students um, during the summer before the, the next school year and so uh, what's the what's the latest on their um, excuses of the late test score results the assessments that we have moved to are less objective and more subjectively graded mm -hmm. meaning with the essays and constructed responses so it's no longer you got it right you didn't get it right a b c d which one did you choose it's not a multiple choice type assessment in total there are parts of it but the major meat of it requires essay writing and constructive responses and when they do it for the entire state and in most cases the country now is moving toward those types of assessments um, they say it's physically impossible to get them all graded that quickly well perhaps they need to hire additional 
um, people to score the test if we want to be constructive in helping our students. And I know we've asked the state that several times. Can we give another plea to them for that possibility of um, getting the test scores back so that we can use them constructively to help the students who need the help? And I know during the summer, we, we talked about the um, programs we have for those students who do uh, need help mm -hmm. before the test scores come in. So how, how are, what, what data are we going to use for those students who are coming in for remediation and enrichment during the summer, besides the summer school? Sure. So we do have, like I said, a summer program for students who need to um, remediate Fs that they've gotten during the school year. But we also have looked at, unfortunately, the LEAP 2021 scores from last spring to give us an indication of students who may need help, to which we've offered a summer program this summer. So we're actually using a, a, a year ago's result, uh, mm -hmm. test scores to help the students this year. That's just unacceptable for the state, uh, you know. Um, and I know we've sent resolutions. What, what can we do possibly to um, yell and scream, get our test scores back earlier so we can help these students before the next year? You know, we wait, we're, there's a whole year lapse, you know, before we were looking at data from the year before. Mm -hmm. So what good is testing if we're not using current data? Well, in all honesty, if you look at this schedule, mm -hmm. In the past, when we were able to get the assessments back by, say, the end of the school year or the beginning of June, the testing was done earlier in the year, like in April or whatever, and yes. there was a, mm -hmm. a whole lot of pushback mm -hmm. that the assessments were too early. You didn't even get in the full <coughs> year of um, work before you were assessing them on it. You didn't even get to cover it all. So they pushed them back a little. But if you look at where they end, which is going to be, say, in most cases, look at the fourth and fifth grade, the last test they're taking is May 16th, and we're only <laughs> going to be in school less than another week, there's no way they're going to turn around all these tests, and they're not going to turn them around statewide or nationwide. So it's test three quarters of the way through school and try to get results back, but then you haven't covered the whole year. Mm -hmm. Or they test later, which was the consensus of what the state decided to do and that's in line with many other states in the country and wait until the end of the summer to get them back so their their argument is that you're getting back at the end of the summer so you can then work out individual plans for them for that next school year mm -hmm. the what you're going to miss you're going to judge your summer skills program based upon the prior year's assessment and how they're progressing during the year based upon what we think as we give those benchmark assessments mm -hmm. each nine weeks mm -hmm. which are like the leap assessments mm -hmm. so we use that data mm -hmm. to see as well so it it's it's one of those catch-22 kinds of situations you know do you and, and they felt a lot of times that when we tested earlier, if you remember in April, in fact, we used to do a constructive responses piece maybe at the end of March. Right, they do a phase one, a phase two. You would do remember constructive response and essay writing first, and then later on you would do Because it would take choice. them two months to grade them. They did do that, phase so one and phase two. So the feeling was they weren't getting enough instruction, and many times they felt, from a human standpoint, instruction stopped after that. <clears throat> Because, oh, we're finished with testing for the year, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things that has been very difficult to manage. And while I'm not happy, really, with either scenario, um, this is the one that's been chosen not only by Louisiana, but many states. Um, and I wish we could get results much sooner, but I don't think it's going to be feasible unless the majority of the state would demand that we test at the end of the third nine weeks almost and I'm not sure if that's a good plan either and the format of the test used to be some multiple choice uh, sections in the beginning and then a couple of constructive response at the end where they could separate it into two sections like Ms. Voce said earlier now, now it's the all writing is all mixed you may have some multiple choice questions and then some constructive response some multiple choice and constructive response extended writing all mixed within a consumable test booklet one test booklet with everything in the book so 
they would really have to redo the test completely if they wanted to do it separately because it is all intertwined now. Yeah. So it, it's, it's difficult, but we take, and you know, philosophically, to be perfectly honest, it really bothers all of us as educators mm -hmm. that kids are measured on what they do on one test. Mm -hmm. right. A school is measured on what they do on one test. Mm -hmm. An entire school district is measured on what they do on one test. That philosophically to me is the absolute worst type of accountability you could have because um, testing and assessment in a, a really holistic way is supposed to be done to inform future instruction. When you assess in anything, whether it's in your job, in your business, or individual students, or people, you're taking a snapshot in time of where some of these skills are, and then you're building on them. It's supposed to be, now we make a plan to make it better, and there should be more frequent monitoring and assessment, which we do throughout the course mm -hmm. of the year. But these end of the year tests have become so important or so, I guess, public that the entire mm -hmm. school is judged in school system on what a kid does one day. If he has a good day, has a bad day, if uh, things didn't go well, you don't get a second chance at it. Even when you take the ACT, or you take other types of assessments, if you don't do quite as well one time, you take it again, and you improve your score and you take it again. Well, it doesn't work that way here. It's just it, it happens, and we have to put all the emphasis on that one testing window, which when you look at it and you say, okay, that kind of argument is, well, if you're in, say, the sixth grade, for example, oh, well, you're only testing them from one, two, three, four, five, six days. But when you look at it from the school's point of view, you're going to be involved in testing an entire month. So in some cases in the, um, with the older kids, you can't, you're not even supposed to let your, that, own, uh, that child's teacher monitor his test. So you're switching teachers' classes. So a teacher from another class comes in to monitor this one class, which means that teacher's class is unattended, that has to have a substitute in it or a switch out. So you're disrupting the whole flow of the educational process over a series of time, even though maybe that one child tests for a week or more, or six, seven, eight days, the entire school is testing for almost a month. And at that point, you're rotating staff back and forth if it's a, a child who needs accommodations, whether they're 504 accommodations or special education accommodations, then those have to be administered individually or in small groups. So from a staffing perspective, all these people have to be trained to administer it. Then their regular duties have to be covered by someone else. So you are disrupting the educational process for quite a period of time with all of this testing. I don't know a better way to do it. The public demand for accountability, everybody's demand for quote accountability is focused in on this one endeavor. And um, from a pure educational point of view, uh, in my humble opinion, it is not the, the be all and end all in the way that you should assess a child, an entire program, a school, or a district based on this one assessment each year. But I don't run the world, and neither do we. <laughs> I mean, this is the way it's set up, and uh, I don't see much of a change in it. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. <laughs> it's, it's frustrating. <laughs> I think it's the same. You know, we, we've, we've broached this, this subject so many times that it seems like year after year. And, mm -hmm. um, I just wish there was more we could do to mm -hmm. get these test results back sooner so that we can use them again in a constructive way. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Thank you. Okay, do we need a motion to accept uh, this? 
No. Just information. All right. Thank you. We appreciate it. Good evening. Um, just the regular right now uh, personnel changes we just had transfer day those will be on at the next board meeting because we completed the interview process and Dr. Aviota now is offering the positions to people and um, we will have that list at the next meeting of what those will be uh, you see some you know normal end of the year resignations and retirements and transfers here <laughs> thank you mr. England um, I have a question before that um, mm -hmm. the, the two high school teachers that um, have given us their resignation or those um, in mass right? which, which subjects are those in um, one is physical education, I think a math, and I think an English. Okay. All right, thank you. And um, I just want to recognize the retirees. It's always hard to see them on the list, but Pamela Stone Rinkus from Smith Elementary, happy retirement to her. And uh, we appreciate all the years of service you've given to the St. Bernard Parish school children and um, also retiring is Shemaine Sciottino. She's been with, been with us, I know, a long time. William Harrison has been with us a long time. And Carolyn Collada. Uh, she must <laughs> have been with us. She's a cornerstone. <laughs> yes, she is a cornerstone. Uh, you know, so happy retirement to Shemaine, William, and Carolyn. And um, Carolyn, I, I know we, we're going to miss all of y'all. And um, we thank you for you so many years of wonderful service. Um, and just these four, four people, I'm sure, um, um, if we add up the years that they've given of service to our students, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. So happy retirement to all of you. And we're sad that you're going, but you do, do deserve some time yeah. to retire. Right. Um, but thank you again for right. all your years of service. Yeah, it is a loss to our school system, it it is. people like this. Mm -hmm. right. And, and I do have to add, when you talk about Carol and Collada, and, and we are going to miss all of them. And, and you know, Bill Harrison has been our electrician for a long time. And But Carol and Collada, um, I'm not going to reveal her age, because that's what Chris <laughs> Owens always said, right? Well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> reveal the age. But she can run rings around just about everybody sitting at uh, around this horseshoe and up and down in that bus. But she has been a bus driver for us for many 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 years and just been absolutely fantastic and um i wish you could go another <laughs> another few but she she's wonderful yeah. and i just wish her well as well as all of the others in their retirement Touché. okay thank you Ms. Fortune. okay uh, we'll move on to item number four finance committee mr warner thank you mr england Finance 4.1 results of RFP for de developmental and intervention software. This How are you guys? Are Everybody's you? good. Hey, good. Good. If you look at um, the f the last sheet, that's the easiest one, um, the easier one because we have two. Um, the last sheet is telling us uh, the language intervention software. We only got one RFP back on this. It was from Renaissance, which is AR. We use that all the time. So we only got one RFP. So of course that was the one we chose. Um, and it, the price, I, I, I meant to get the price from last year, but it's very similar. This is a three year price that we have on it now. $114,000 a year. No, 90,000, I'm sorry, 90,000. But that's for licenses for 6,500 students. Okay? And then the second page, we got five people that submitted a bid for our developmental software. And if you noticed, Alexia, the second one, came out on top when we scored it. And it is um, $114,000. Um, compared to some of the other 
prices that was very reasonable. I mean, I know that sounds like a lot, but it's 114,000. That's for Lexia and also power up Lexia for um, the high school kids and the middle school kids. So it's not just for elementary, it's for um, elementary and middle school Lexia power up. Okay, so that was the results of the two RFPs that we sent out. And if you look at the front, we put the, um, the developmental software, Lexia, and the intervention software, Renaissance Learning, which is AR. And that's the prices. Any questions from any board members? This is Jackson. Um, are these prices, you mentioned it's for a multi-year license. Is this price for one year or for the? One year. year. Because what we do is um, we ask for a, an RFP for a three, like we'll have the same price for three years. And then in three years, we have to put out another RFP. Okay. And I was surprised because the prices really didn't go up that much for this. Okay. Okay. We're you. in an online world <laughs> where right. the, we know, I mean, we still have textbooks and such, but all of the materials are online at this point and the licenses for all of these are continuing to go up just like textbook prices right used to keep climbing they didn't go up as much as we thought to be honest with right. you. and then um we were talking yeah we're talking about testing before and fourth grade this is the first year they're going to be taking an online test in this parish some of the parishes have taken it before but this is our first year that fourth grade will be taking the online test and if you notice for testing third grade is the time that you have to give it that's why we had to push our fourth and fifth grade like three days later to give the counselors time to finish the third grade to go into fourth grade and fifth grade. That's why we're so late with fourth and fifth grade testing. I didn't want to get into testing. I'm into RFP. So, so um, let's, let's finish RFP. Oh. <laughs> any other questions for any other board members? Uh, I, I have a question. Sure. Um, Lexia, is that what we used last year? You said we used Renaissance last year. Okay, we used Renaissance for AR, and um, it's 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 um, developmental. Where Lexia, a child gets on Lexia, and it tells them what their level is, and then they keep going from there. That's one of the tests we used to to use for um, for um, we use Star Reading for summer school. We look at how they did from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, and we still do that in summer school. We'll use Lexia, AR, and all, and Zern, and all the other things that we use in our summer program. Yes, it's the same thing. So Renaissance is the accelerated, accelerated reader, reader. You know, where they're reading all the books and, and then they take tests. The, test. the Lexia, though, <coughs> if you could just expand a little bit, it, it gives the kids their reading levels or Lexile levels, and they can progress it's through a, it's it. A, it's a natural progression. Like they can't, they can't move from here to here. They have to move from here to here. And when they pass here, they go to the next level. It's like a continuum. And they can do it at home, too. I know a lot of the parents are happy that we allow them to do Lexia at home because that does build their developmental skills. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. It's developmental skill building, basically. And we use it for everybody. But they have a, a, a Lexia power up for the, the high, like once you, once you get to a level in Lexia, then they have power up, which is another higher expansion of it. Right, if, you, if you're a really good reader mm -hmm. and you go through your levels quickly, then the power up, the power up takes enhances over. that and moves you forward more quickly. Mm -hmm. All right, and that, so that includes power up and the regular Lexia, okay? So before inflation kicks in and the price goes up by 20%. <laughs> but we the had these <laughs> prices for three years. <laughs> yeah, for three years. I have a motion by Mrs. White, seconded by Mr. Smith, to send to the full board with a recommendation, the RFPs that were accepted for Lexia and Renaissance. Okay. And I'll be back in two weeks, I guess. All right. Thank you. All, have a all nice in favor? Vote your machine. Motion passes, Ms. Bowman, Lee Bowman, yeah. Motion passes 10-0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, move on to item 4.2 to 2021-2022 revised general fund and special revenue fund budgets. Mr. Fernandez. Oh, Mr. Luana. 
Good evening. In your package, you have uh, our revised budget for before Mr. Fernandez gets started. Oh. Okay, I know. <laughs> before you get started, I, I always <laughs> defer to you, Ms. Hood. No, I just really wanted to frame. I, I know that last year at this same time that um, you know y'all had talked to us about seeing what we could do for our teachers and all of our employees because of everything that was going on, the extra duties they have to do. If you go to the elementary schools, you're going to see teachers on duty in the morning, in the afternoon, at lunch, monitoring, not even eat, being able to go somewhere and eat their own lunch. They're sitting there going back and forth. Um, so we were able, with these federal monies that are coming in, to move some of the expenditures to the federal funds and able to use some general fund monies to grant a, um, a stipend to our employees. And y'all indicated, you know, we talked about this before, about trying to do that again. So in this revised budget, much of what you're going to see with the increase in salaries and, and benefits is going to be um, the stipend that we want to do again this year in the same fashion and that's the result of being able to move some expenses to the federal funds and free up for an employee who has been with us all year. They must be here at the end of the school year. They can't have left in the middle of the year or whatever. They have to be with us at the end of the school year. And what we are proposing at your request is the same supplement that we did last year for the teachers, for the certificated people a $2,000 stipend, and for the non-certificated people, the $1,500 stipend. And um, all of the employees are very grateful for it. Last year, you had asked us to look at it to try to do it again this year. So we asked Mr. Fernandez to make sure that that could occur in this budget, and he has done so. And that's going to be a major portion of some of the increases that you see, in fact, all the increases that you're seeing in the salary and benefit parts of uh, this budget. Okay. I'm sorry? I took his thunder now. I tell you, I have nothing more to say. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right, in your uh, package here of the revised budget, the first three exhibits relate to the general fund. And the fourth relates to the special revenue fund. So the first one is a summary, which shows what we are projecting total revenues and expenditures, other financing sources and uses, uh, and uh, ending fund balance for the general fund. And the detail of those numbers in the following two exhibits. The first one is revenues, and I'll just highlight the major changes in the revenues. We've increased uh, sales tax revenues because our sales taxes have been coming in at a higher level in the past, uh, the past year, uh, as we uh, had discussed, due mostly to additional online sales tax revenue collections and also some stimulus monies that we're uh, getting the benefit of sales taxes on those expenditures. You'll notice in the E-rate reimbursements, there is a substantial increase of $2.2 million. We were approved through the E-rate, which is a federal program which funds many uh, technology, infrastructure, and equipment purchases. We approved through the E-rate for uh, a $2.2 million reimbursement to fund the purchase of Chromebooks for our schools. So you'll see that as an additional revenue, and on the expenditure side, you'll see the expenditure of those funds. Uh, we've adjusted our MFP allocation to the final allocation for 2021-2022. And we've made uh, some adjustments to the other grants to reflect their final allocation amounts. Uh, on the expenditure side, as Ms. Boche said, uh, in the salary and benefits categories, you'll notice the increases related to those proposed uh, stipend amounts for certified and uncertified staff. And we've made some other adjustments to the other operational accounts just to uh, refine those estimates for the end of the year. 
you'll see on the first page at the bottom that $2.2 million in technology supplies that relates to the E-rate uh, revenues in the revenue budget. But other than that, we think that fairly presents how we expect to, en expect to end up in the general fund. Exhibit 4 is all of our special revenue funds. Individually in each column is a separate fund and it shows our anticipated revenues and expenditures in those funds. For the grant funds, this represents the final allocations for this year in those particular uh, grant funds. And we also have the Avalar Maintenance Fund, which is the fund which the board established with a uh, millage to uh, accumulate monies for the repair and upkeep of our buildings. And the last column is the lunch fund, which is the lunch fund operations. And it shows the anticipated results of those funds. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Fernandez. Do we have any questions from board members? Mr. Long. Uh, see, Mr. Fernandez, uh, the, uh, the stipends, uh, it's nice to see that for our employees. It's well deserved. Um, when uh, when will the uh, will the stipends be given out to the employees? Uh, as Ms. Voce said, it's going to be uh, for all eligible employees that uh, serve through the end of the year. So it'll probably be in the end of May, beginning of June. End of May, beginning of June. Okay, that's good. That's great. Glad to see that. Um, you answered a couple of my questions already, but there's one other thing. The uh, the MFP, the uh, looks like we've adjusted downward with the MFP. Yeah, every uh, year the MFP, uh, you get an initial allocation and then it is adjusted based on your enrollment. Uh, we've experienced a slight de decrease in enrollment in the fall. However, we gain students in the spring. They take two enrollment dates, counts. October 1st and February 1st. So that's the net amount from those two counts. And it's just an adjustment, a minor adjustment to the MFP for those months. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Mr. England. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Mr. Fernandez, the, um, yes, sir. for the lunch and for the gas, I mean, you know, with the cost of inflation that's being assessed right now throughout the whole country, it's mm -hmm. going to affect us too. Uh, yes. Do we have a nice cushion to, to yes. cover this? Yes, we had, we had budgeted those uh, gasoline conservatively at the beginning of the year, and I think we're within our budget for uh, that. As for next year, if the, if the prices continue to rise, we'll have to reflect that in the new year budget. Right. But I think we're covered for this year. And what about the food? You know, as far food as the know. same. Same you know, thing. there is going to be an increase in food as well, but yeah. I think we're well covered in the current year's budget. Next okay. year, we're just opening up our food bids for next year. So once we see how those pan yeah, out in, in, in uh, comparison to this year, we may have some increases in yeah. next year. It's going to be a little shocker there, I think. Yeah, and unfortunately, federal reimbursement doesn't keep up with the uh, rising cost right. of inflation oftentimes. Right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sure. Any other questions from any other board members? I have a question. Um, Certainly. You mentioned about the increase in the sales and use tax. Yes. $3 million, that's fairly significant. Is that because we're getting better at uh, identifying sales tax? or the, uh, What, what happened is, first of all, we conservatively budgeted sales taxes at the beginning of the year. We usually do that until we can see how sales taxes are running. Uh, sales taxes have, have been consistently been running higher every month in comparison to last year. Now, uh, the, a lot of that is due to the collection of sales taxes on online transactions. As you know, for the longest time, online transactions, the vendors didn't charge sales tax and the, those revenues were lost and now the law requires them to start collecting it or people to start claiming it on their tax returns and honestly and, and that has been making a big impact on sales tax collections now that 
you'll notice that if you make a purchase on Amazon.com, it will charge you tax now, and right. those are remitted to the local state. So that has made an impact on our sales tax collections for this year. So we feel confident that uh, that <coughs> we'll be able to reach that amount. It's based on we've uh, had the first eight months of collections for the year. We have four, four months left to go because we get collections two months after the date of the sales taxes. So we're fig we are confident that the last four months will come in the same and we'll reach that target. Okay. Mr. Um, England and I went to a presentation in St. Charles Parish about a month ago and the uh, one of the presentations had to do with the online sales tax commission that has been set up at the state level and they talked about how it is significantly increasing based upon their work and that the major companies are now doing that and it's flowing through the state then right. down to the locals so while I'm sure the whole three million doesn't isn't accounted for in that respect but we're seeing significantly more coming in and hopefully that's going to increase yeah, I think as the bill's coming back again, the centralized sales tax collection um, by the state. That's going to come back, but that's a little bit different than this commission. Yeah. This particular commission is dealing with only online sales from these out of out of state um, businesses right. that are that are headquartered out of state, like the Amazon, like the ones that you see a lot that are now agreeing to charge those sales taxes and remit it through the state. What's happening now is they want a bill like they tried last year, which failed as a constitutional amendment to have a single sales tax collector. At this point, our sheriff is opposed to that and many of the local entities because then it would take over, everything would flow through the state down to the local, including all local sales taxes. And um, that's a whole different discussion, <laughs> and that has to be worked out. Because um, personally, and, and they keep saying that well, it shouldn't cost the locals anymore, but local entities. But I just can't believe. I mean, right now, if you look at the sales tax commission that we remit to the sheriff for the collection, if now it's going to go through the state and then through the sheriff and then to us. I can't, it's hard for me to believe the state wouldn't impose some type of a fee for a central state collection before. So I don't know how all that's going to be worked out and not cost us anything more in terms of a decrease in our local revenues. That's to be seen. But if you notice when that constitutional amendment failed statewide, all of the local tax collectors were obviously opposed to it. So I don't know how it would impact us, in other words. But these online sales is a whole different thing. That wasn't being collected at all before to any large extent. And um, now we're seeing that flowing through. I have one other question. Uh, what is going to uh, approximately the total cost of the stipend uh, in a run about for uh, our employees? Approximately $2 million. Approximately $2 million. Money well spent. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Well spent. Well worth my opinion. Mm -hmm. Anything we can do for our employees to help them out, I'm on board with. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll entertain a motion. Oh, do you have a question? Yes. Okay. Well, actually, I, I think we all feel the same way. Our teachers and our uh, support personnel definitely deserve a stipend for all that they do throughout the entire year. And just a clarification, this will not affect the, those teachers that are just on medical leave and coming back, right? It's it's going to cover all our, of our It teachers. should cover all, unless, now if a teacher has been on a leave without pay all year and not been here, no, they will not receive the stipend. Okay, but if, if they're on a medical. If we're talking a short-term medical leave, mm -hmm. like six weeks or something, mm -hmm. like pregnancy or whatever, that will not affect anything. They will receive the stipend. Okay, I appreciate the clarification. and. Um, I know, like I said, I think each and every one of us are very happy that we're 
um, able to fund the stipend for the, our teachers and the support personnel. And um, just a small um, thank you to them for all they do throughout the year. And hopefully we'll be able to do the same thing again next year. So um, also, I know there's a bill in the Senate in, um, that that's going around about the ITEP. So, um, and overriding Governor Edwards's um, uh, decisions with the ITAP. And I, so I wanted to ask the um, administration if we can do some, and I, I, it might have to be at the, the next meeting, but if we could get a resolution to support the current law as it states so that we have a local say here um, locally for our school system on the ITAP. So if you would, Ms. Dote, okay. we can do that because right. that will affect our budgets in the, way, the future also. Right. The way, the way I understand it, the governor signed an executive order putting the ITEP in place, which now says it's that 80-20 split if you go ahead and grant the industrial tax exemption. Um, the, it, they would be 80% exempt and you still collect 20% of the revenues. Before he did the executive order, the state tax commission, if they granted them the, assess the uh, exemption, local governmental bodies got nothing. They were totally exempt 100%. When this governor goes out of office, whoever is next can come in and just revoke the executive order. And we would revert back to the state uh, tax commission bond and bond commission being able to grant the total exemption. What's happening right now is that there's a piece of legislation going forward to put into law the ability to stay the way the executive order reads, that each local governmental body would get the vote to make it the 80-20 split, you know, or not give it to them at all. But it, and. I've looked at some that'll say, put it in to, if the state tax commission approved it, to give them the 80-20 split. So depending upon how that comes out, then I'm understanding it would be a constitutional amendment. That would have to be voted on so the next governor can't come back and do another executive order, whichever way he or she would wish it to be. So the legislation coming forward would be to take what's currently in place for the executive order, put it in the Constitution, and allow local governments to have some say-so in that taxing authority. So we can draw up something like that. We'll look at the, um, the proposed legislation and see what we can come up with. Great. Thank okay. you. Mr. Long. Uh, well, I, I support Ms. Dysart. I think that's a good suggestion that we do a do a resolution. Uh, I think what we have to remember is that's our tax money, and we should have a say so on on uh, if we uh, want to grant exemptions to these corporations. It's only it's only the fairest thing to do. But thank you very much, Mr. England. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Warren. At this time, I'd like to make a motion to send to the full board the revised general plan and special reference plan. I'll second. I have a motion by Mr. England, seconded by Ms. Jackson. All in favor, vote your machine. Motion passes 10 0. All right. Thank you. Back to you, Mr. England. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Okay, the Okay. Um, I just want to, I know we posted it on Facebook, but I just want to um, congratulate the Shaman High School Pro Start students. Uh, they went to the statewide competition a week and a half, two weeks ago, and won the whole thing. They placed first in the management part and first in the culinary part. And that's from all of the Pro Start uh, programs in the state, which means that they will represent Louisiana in Washington, D.C. in May to participate in the national competition that's sponsored by the you know, restaurant associations. 
So uh, we're very, very proud of them. Their teacher is Elaine Hodges over at Shelmet High, and they also work closely with the um, culinary program at Nunez Community College as well. And our uh, Mr. Morrell, who runs our food service program, checks in <coughs> on them and helps them a little bit as well. So it was a really remarkable day that we won both parts of the competition and will be the representative from Louisiana. So congratulations <laughs> to John High School and the Coast Art students. And they'll be exiting their program with industry-based certifications and hopefully then um, will continue their culinary education and or experiences beyond high school. I just also wanted to mention that the play, the Shaman High School play, The Sound of Music, um, because of the tornado situation was pushed back. It's now going to be April 29th, 30th, and May 1st, that weekend. Um, so that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, April 29, 30, and May 1st. Um, I wanted to mention something about our buses because we, we're not necessarily going to bring it before the board for permission because it's on the state contract. But since it's going to be such a large purchase, I wanted to make sure that everyone uh, was on board with this. As you know, we lost three buses uh, due to the tornado. I'm sure everybody saw the overturned buses over at Araby and they've been checked out and the insurance adjuster has come. and. We're still working through that. But those three buses have been totaled and we're going to have to replace them. We also are going to buy two additional buses, another regular red bus, and we need a special ed bus. Air condition, the whole bus. But the price of buses nowadays runs <laughs> $111,000 each on state contracts. So I wanted to, since we're not going to bid them out, we can buy them through the state contract, I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that. And of course, when we deal with the manufacturers, we probably won't get these buses for almost another year, the way things are going with the backup in parts. If, you have, if you've been trying to get your car repaired or whatever lately, and they tell you they won't have the parts for another couple of months, same thing is happening um, with our bus situation as well. Ms. Gennart was telling me this afternoon that as we try to get our buses, you know, body parts repaired or whatever, it's taking a long time. I said, well, how long can that possibly take? She said, I've been waiting three months for my own private car, you know, and they still can't get the parts. So a lot of that is delayed, so we want to put those orders in as quickly as possible. They have been bid out by the state of Louisiana. They're on the state contract, and we want to go ahead and place the order so that uh, we can get them moving as quickly as possible, and I wanted everybody to be aware of that. It, Ms. Fletcher, uh, mm -hmm. don't we, each year we, we replace five buses. Would it be? Well, not necessarily five. It, de it, it depends. Right. Because that what we did years and years ago, when we were doing that right. five year and then Katrina hit, then we had to buy like 20 or 30 at a time. So we're, we're replacing as the need arises. So right now we're gonna order five, uh, three of them because of the storm. Ms. Gennard is confident that just two at this point, and then we're going to reassess at the end of the year and take a look at it. Because it's price, the pricing on these things are obviously. Um, I can remember when they were 70000 each, and I thought that was a lot. Now when we put in all the bells and whistles that we do, because we get the safest there is and the best there is, and then we're air conditioning them as well. So they're at right now 111000 each. Yes, that that three mills that we passed a long time ago and that we renewed in the last went to, if you remember, asbestos removal, purchasing of buses right. and instructional materials. Right. Okay. So those were the three targeted for the particular three for one of the the millages that we have, the three mills. 
Mrs. Voce, you mentioned the uh, tornado. Did Arby Elementary sustain a, a significant damage in there? Or? No, the, it, it did not. I mean, it, it has some roof damage, some um, at the top exterior where the roof meets the, um, the top of the building, a little bit of damage in those areas. Uh, but it was, and what was very strange too, when you walk through it afterward, if you walk down that long hall from the front of the building to the end of the building, it looked like a disaster area because some, it, right down the middle of that hall, all of the ceiling tiles and the grid were just pulled out. And you know those thick fire doors that are at the end of the hall that you yeah. look, ripped off? Wow. Classrooms on both sides of the hall totally unaffected. Wow. Okay. Classrooms were fine. But the hall itself, so some pressure or something just went right down the middle of that. And then we had some exterior, you know, equipment, a little shed uh, that we housed, the tricycles and all that in the, in the backyard was destroyed. And the fence around it, where those buses were turned over, that back fence. Jeez. So while we had damage, we were extremely fortunate. Uh, we had the roofers there. Um, Jason Dewey did a tremendous job with his staff. The very next morning, we had uh, Fisher Roofing up there to do the temporary fix on the roof. Uh, we're dealing, as everyone else now, with insurance people and adjusters, and then, <laughs> right. you know, I don't know um, if there will be any FEMA claims on this, because as has been said a lot, it, it depends on the amount of damage, the monetary mm -hmm. amount of damage, and since this was a very small event, when you look at statewide, it has to meet certain monetary thresholds to for FEMA to kick in. So right. we're waiting to see if we'll get any reimbursement on that at all. So anything that the insurance doesn't cover then. Right. And you know, we have big deductibles. Yeah, so we, we, but uh, we good thing we have that fund set up that right. anticipated this, so we're fine. We will be fine. It was not uh, so significant that we have major issues, so we're, we were very, very fortunate. Yeah, we uh, we we voted to uh, for the owning insurance that very night. Shortly thereafter, the clap of thunder occurred, mm -hmm. and Mr. England ran <laughs> the right. rest of the agenda. Uh -huh. And um, it was a significant increase on. Oh, here's Mr. Insurance. Fernandez. He's probably going to update me on something. What? It was a significant Just to increase. let you know, you voted on the insurance that night, and we had to send a copy of the minute showing the time the meeting ended to show that you voted on it before the ter tornado hit. Otherwise, oh. it would have affected <laughs> That's true. Okay. our insurance policy that we renewed. So, wow. good job uh, <laughs> voting on it before uh, the damage. Before the tornado. <laughs> 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 it, it was a significant increase, but it just goes to show you that you know you have to plan for uncertainty and you have to sometimes pay the price. But we got it in. That's the main thing. You know? Sajay, speaking of the the tornado, I know that the the community has come together and provided a significant response to um, students that may have been affected by the tornado. I know we've taken in some school supply donations, uniforms. Do we still have we been able to meet the needs of all of the students who have been affected or is there still a need for additional um, support? I think, I think we're getting there. Um, we've been able to supply like uniforms and shoes and school supplies and such. Um, I can't tell you right now if there's a need for a significant amount more, but um, I'm sure that we're going to have to replenish some of this. If, if there is, can you let the board members know yes. so that we can assist with reaching out to the community and pointing people in the right direction? Because there have been so many people that want to help but just don't know what to do. And, you know, this is, this is not a problem that's not going to be solved in a day or an hour. You know, it's going to be ongoing. So anything that we can do to help assist, just let us mm -hmm. know. 
And you know what I do want to mention is we had several employees who were also significantly affected. Their homes, um, whether they need to be repaired or a couple replaced, um, they're hurting too, as well as our kids and those families. So I do know that we're seeing if we can direct some things their way in terms of maybe some gift cards for supplies and those kinds of things. And really, the, the gift cards, too, uh, are, are really the most, I guess, appreciated mm -hmm. when you go to Home Depot or you can go to one of these places and get the supplies that you need to um, help repair your home or what. And, and then, the, of course, the kids, we're going to make sure that none of the kids suffer in terms of supplies, clothing, or whatever. Okay. But Just let us know. Thank and you. I'll, I'll will. be happy to okay. And And speaking of that, I, I don't know exactly what's happening here, but I got a text today, and I haven't directly, I, I talked with Mr. Warner a little bit, and he retexted me, but they reached out to him. You know, Ronnie Lamarck is a native St. Bernardian, and he grew up in Araby. He attended Araby Elementary School and Shelman High School. His father was the custodian at Araby Elementary years ago. It's our understanding that he's going to make a $250,000 donation to the parish for the fund that they have established for tornado relief and we think what is happening, we have a baseball game Thursday night where Shalman High is playing Lutcher, and it seems to be a, a, a pretty big baseball game because both teams are doing well. And they're, you know how they live stream some of those games? Well, this one is going to be streamed on Crescent City Streaming. Crescent City shaking? Sports. Crescent City Sports. You probably know more about it than I do, Mr. Warner. So they um, are going to stream the game, but it seems like he's going to come prior to the game and present the check to Guy McGinnis at the baseball game Thursday night. And I'm just finding this out today. Now, I'm sure if they prod him a little bit, he may even sing the national anthem <laughs> before the game. Uh, <laughs> um, that, that's a, that, that kind could of money, he might sing a couple of songs. Yeah, yeah he might. But anyway, I just wanted to let everyone know that he intends, from what I'm understanding, and I hope I have accurate information, that he is going to be donating a $250,000 check to, par to the parish for that relief fund that they have set up. But it'll just be happening at prior to our baseball game. <laughs> the game is at 6. This is supposed to be happening prior to the game. Uh, Mr. England saw David, David Brassett this morning somewhere, and I got a text from him this morning. So we think we have accurate information. Okay, that's it. Oh, and just a, 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 I guess a reminder to everyone, the Easter holidays will be beginning Thursday, so our students are off Thursday and Friday and Monday and Tuesday um, to have a happy Easter with their families. So, Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you, Ms. Foche. Uh, we'd just like to wish um, on behalf of the board, everybody, happy Easter. And uh, everybody just stay safe on the roads, please. Um, item number six, adjournment. Move to adjournment. Moved by Mr. Campbell, seconded by Mr. Egan. Second. All in favor? Aye. This means adjourn. Thank you. Have a happy Aye. Easter.